One of the things I think a lot of people need to understand is we aren't a museum piece. The Inupiaq people are a living people and a living culture. Even though we're in northern Alaska, which covers this vast area from Nome all the way over the Canadian border, is that there is this extreme value of interconnectedness and interdependence. It's a hunting society, a gathering society, from thousands of years. This is what creates our culture. That special relationship between humans and the natural world and the animals, and that it teaches you how to have a, a society that doesn't do too much harm to the world. Love and respect for nature, for one another, for our elders, very, very fundamental value, key to, key to life. Our values are something that bind us all. The importance of sharing with one another, the importance of spirituality, and the connection to the land, our traditions, how we hunt, sharing of stories and songs and dances. I'm Inupiaq. I'm from the Arctic Ocean. Inupiaq. I am Inupiaq. It's very important to me. It's, it's who I am as a person. And we're very proud of who we are and we want to continue that. It'd be busy, busy, busy all through the day. You get up and you just go right to work, you know? Right to work. There's always something to do. There's never any idle time. The only idle time we had was after we eat and before we go to bed. One of the older people would just be just relaxing, laying down there and saying, you know, it'd be really nice to hear a story. And then just organically, someone would just start telling the story. Storytelling for the Nupiak people is very important because it not only created that sense of community, but is a way to pass on wisdom to the next generation. It was like TV, you know? <laughs> it was just like, it was as good as anything, you, any movie you've ever seen. And the storyteller told it so clearly that it was just as powerful as any of the greatest movie blockbusters you've ever seen. There was a reason behind the stories that we were told because they held traditional knowledge. They held things that we might need to know in life, whether it was about how to find food or how to survive, or it was about like, well-being and the importance of connecting with people and being a good member of the community. We all do stories. We all live in stories. We all tell stories to our friends and, and they need to be told. They need to be heard. So scrimshaw is this really beautiful method of art that's done either on baleen or ivory. And traditionally, it was used to tell stories. Each etching is telling a story of some event. Uh, caribou hunting was taking place, this is what was going on. War began around this time, and so it sort of gives you a timeline of history through etching. An elder or the person who carved it would literally be able to read the Scrimshaw story. They're like reading a book, in a way. A lot of the storytelling traditions would be things that after the storytelling was done, we'd just rely on the next person telling it. And so scrimshaw is a very important way for Alaskan Native people to record their history. When I was growing up, uh, my grandpa's uh, had a pet white fox. If you're a good friend with a fox, when there's danger abound, they try to keep you from getting into trouble. They pull tricks here and there, and 
Foxes are uh, like uh, spoiled little kids in a way. When you let her out, she'd go prancing out in the snow, jumping in the air. I know she was happy then. Come running at me and jump on my chest, knock me backwards, lick my face, and, and I try not to let her. So that was my memory of my grandpa's pet fox. Caribou was, it, it provided for us in many ways. Our clothing in those days was made of all caribou skin. I grew up wearing caribou pants, mittens, caribou skin mattress, blankets. Some people had boots that were made with wolf leggings, sealskin sole bottoms. Baleen was shaved to make insoles. They kept us quite dry and warm as well. But the caribou skin clothing was the best. We would get as many yearlings as we could for our outer clothing. And for a heavy winter, we would get caribou in February or March because the hair was the longest and the skin was the thickest and we would use those for our winter gear. With that stuff on, you could sleep outside in 50 below and it wouldn't bother you a bit. Silla is the weather. It also means the atmosphere. Here's the Nuna, or the land. And it's anything from the land into the moon, the sun, the stars. That's Silla. It's, uh, it's a very spiritual, and we have a relationship with Silla. Uh, Silla has a soul in the same way we do as people, in the same way animals do. I think spirit helpers in and of themselves are really about how we're connected with things. And so it may be that there is a spirit helper that shows themselves as a bird to show you the way home. Or it may be a spirit helper that actually decides to show themselves with the face and body of a man instead of their animal form. And so I think one of the things that's hard to understand is that it's not one way of seeing things. It's one way of knowing you're connected to everything. We've always had that spirituality of everything around us. It's the interaction you have with the air you breathe, the, the ocean that you gather resources from, the rivers from which you gather fish, the tundra from which you pick berries, the animals that give themselves. It's, it's all of all of that. In the winter, when we were traveling, we didn't build sod houses, we built snow houses. In Canada, they call them igloo, but here in Alaska, we call them apuya. We do a day of travel, and then we'd make an apuya. The next day, my father would set traps, spend the day there, rest the dogs, give them something to eat, and then the following day, we continue to the next place. We'd go to my dad's sister, who had a house at Dubar. They had a small sod house over there. We didn't have to do anything. We just visit with them, and my dad and my sister were glad to see each other, and they'd talk away while us kids played outside or go to sleep. By the time we get back to our home, my father would leave us with our aunt or with my grandmother, and then he'd start on his trips and go check his trap line. We were not into 8 to 5 kind of time, you know. We're in a totally different kind. We're in ecological time. The 
Drum is something that's common to all cultures in Alaska. All cultures have a drum that may have some stylistic differences or differences in the materials that it's made, but it's still in recognition of life and vitality. And the drum mirrors the heartbeat. And when you continue drumming soon, it will be in line with your heartbeat. Because that's what it's supposed to be, the heartbeat of the community. And it symbolizes vitality. And it's, it's the most tremendous feeling to be in a room and to have one long row of all the drummers and to have that feeling of unity and everyone beating in harmony, the drum beat in unison. It's the most beautiful feeling. And to know that you're connected, you're on the land that you are connected to. And even if you grew up outside of the community, that which is in you comes from this area. And it's, it's the greatest feeling. Man, I went at it and look what happens. <laughs>just like other people they just happen to be very small and extremely strong these are stories that are common throughout Alaska and it's normally that people are you know size from your elbow to the tips of your fingers and they possess superhuman strength so they may be tiny but they can carry a whole caribou and if you go up north and you talk to a number of the people in the community they'll talk about having seen the little people there's a place at home that we know, but we don't profess it to anybody. But it's not like the boogeyman. They can be mischievous, they can be ornery, or they can be helpers. And every now and then, we might have the opportunity to see them, especially if they want us to see them. The fact that it's across Alaska really tells you something about our history and how we interacted with nature around us. The bola is what we call kilometown. And the kilometown is made out of braided sinew tied out to some heavy bone which you could twirl. In my case, we're catching ducks. When we were out whaling, sometimes the ducks start flying. And they're good for duck hunting. You know, uh, if you're a whaling crew, you can't make too much noise. So you can't use a shotgun for um, getting some duck soup handy, you know. So bolo was a really handy weapon to use for catching ducks. You know, the ducks fly in, you throw it up and tangles up the bird, and down they go. The scaredest I've ever been, I was 12 years old. We floated out on a piece of ice uh, while we were duck hunting. It was a bluebird day, just clear blue skies. And there was three of us, myself, my brother, and my dad. Next thing you know, we see this dark, dark shadow on the ice. Uh, we look and it goes behind us. So we, we all jumped up startled and uh, my dad, he started running. We got back to the ridge there. The, uh, the ice had fractured, cracked, and broke off and we were floating away. We were, we were drifting. <laughs> It was close enough to where my dad would have made it. He stopped and he thought about throwing us across and if one of us was on the other side, we would be split up. So he stopped and he just so happened to have a, a cell phone on him. 911 didn't pick up. <laughs> That's the worst feeling in the world right there. 911 did not pick up. So he left a, a message because they record their calls. Once he had relayed that information, his cell phone died. That was 
the scariest moment I've ever had in my life. We were floating away and I thought we were left for dead. Uh, he kept calm during this situation. Uh, he's bringing out everything positive in this case. You know, I'm crying, my brother's freaking out. It went from clear blue to dense, dense fog. Within a couple hours, we heard the chopper flying around, so they must have gotten our message. We thought we were saved, and then the chopper sound went away. So we lit some of the sled on fire. It's plastic. We thought black smoke in the fog would create some kind of marker. Chopper pilot uh, had mentioned uh, when we got rescued, you could see a glow in the fog and he slowed down there and sure enough as soon as he slowed down uh, we got within visual that was definitely the scariest moment of my life was floating away and not knowing what the outcome was going to be we're very much aware of the climate change and it's been for many years, even before climatologists were noticing this change, Inuit were already saying, Sila Alangoktok, our climate is changing. If the heat is going the way it is right now, for us it's going to be pretty bad. Different birds are coming, and they're coming earlier, and sometimes rain is more than what we want because when there's more rain, we know it's going to melt the permafrost. In my time as a young whaler, when I was nine years old, we're hunting from ice that was about 25 feet thick. And there's giant icebergs already floating, coming by. That was the first signs of a changing climate. Ice that never broke before was now moving. Now, here it is 50, years later, we're hunting whale from ice that's 18 inches thick. There's no more thick ice. It's creating a malfunction in our whaling season, is, is what it is. Actually, more than that, all seasons in general. I think we are more scientists than more people will realize. We have more knowledge of those things than people will ever know. My brother was out seal hunting. He got attacked from behind and managed to grab his knife and save himself. When he came to realize, oh no, it's a mother. We've always known traditionally that we avoid killing a mother. It's always been sacred to us to protect them. He had to present himself to the council and so he was given the job to mother the baby, and we kept it. It got so big, it went over the barricade one day and got to the dark food, and that was an indication that, oh, oh, brother better go teach it how to survive on its own. So he did. I really got attached to the bear because I more or less grew up with it. And some days when brother took him walking, once in a great while he'd put me on the beer and I would ride on it like a horse. Just, I was just the happiest little girl in the world. In, you know, Arctic Alaska, hunting is a really important part of life. It's not just about going and shooting something, it's about going and putting food on the table. But more importantly, you know, subsistence hunting isn't just about the insular family unit, it's about feeding the whole community. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about subsistence hunting in Alaska is that people go out and they'll go get, you know, fish or they'll get a caribou and they'll get, you know, seals and whales. and one of the first things they'll do is they'll say, oh, I need to take this to the elders. 
This isn't just about one individual surviving or one family surviving. It's about the whole community. We didn't just go out and kill and put, and put in a freezer. It's like a ritual that I learned from my parents. It's, it's all about relationship. I don't know. I think there's, there, there's a lot of camaraderie involved. Uh, and, and, and just being out on the land or being out on the ocean, it's like getting back in tune. I'd rather be out there. To me, once I go out there, it's the world that I learned from. Now we spend all our time out in nature. You get very intimate with the world. And over time, if you're living that life, you start to sense that everything has a spirit. There's a consciousness in everything. Everything is alive. If everything is alive, then, then we want to respect it. And if we're going to use it, we want to use it respectfully. What I try to tell my nephews and nieces, you know, you love to hunt, you have to take care of the animals that you catch, preparing the food and eating the food that you catch. Water provides you. The ice brings you life. It provides all those things that you need to be a part of your life. That was something I grew up with. I grew up respecting the animals. I grew up respecting the land. And that, to me, that is why we as Inupiaq, as an Inupiaq culture, as an Inupiaq people, is why we're so successful. I think most central to the ideology of the Inupiat is, is the idea of sharing. Being able to feed the community, feed others, that's why we hunt, you know, in the old days, it's, it's, that's what you needed to survive, you know. The sharing is important because it's how the community survives together collectively. We just give. That's how I grew up. That's the way I'm always going to be because of who we are. We always think about other people first. If, if our people didn't share in, you know, in the old days, we wouldn't have survived in this harsh you know, climate, environment. The big time eat, little time eat, and King Island. And in those th uh, three islands are the stepping stones to get to America. So King Island is this absolutely beautiful place off the coast of Alaska. And if you can imagine being on this really kind of rocky island that kind of shoots up from the water to these cliffs, and then all of a sudden you see these stilts and then you look up and there are these houses. They were built on the cliff up high because of the ice. Being an island in the Bering Sea, you have ice that's being pushed by the winds onto the island. So it's going to pile up uh, 50, 60 feet high. Structures are still there today, and uh, people have returned to King Island. It's a growing community as the people return back to their island. When I was young, my mom, whenever the Northern Lights came out, she just whistle. <laughs> Boy, they come alive. Just keep whistling and that aurora will just like, you know, you can almost hear it. And then she explained to me uh, a little bit later that those are children and children who've passed away when they were children. You don't want to draw them in too much, you know, is what she said. Because then they could play football with your head. Play Eskimo football, and that's what they want to do. They're always playing, those children up there. Don't 
play out without your hood on. If you had, don't have your hood on, the Aurora person is going to come down and chop your head off and play ball with your head. It wasn't like they were trying to do bad, you know, or it was like a scary story or anything like that. It was just, that's what, that's how it was. That's what it was. In the month of November, there's no sun. So during that dark time, we travel by the light of the moon. It's quite different. Everything was silver and black. Toward the horizon, we could see where caribou are because their body heat flowing upward and we could see it glowing in the moonlight against a dark horizon where there's no stars. If somebody yelled, you could know who yelled from where the sound came from, but specifically for that cloud of their breath went up and it, it glowed in the moonlight. So that was a good time to travel. It was very surrealistic. And so things that were dark objects looked very close and white objects looked very far. We are taught that there's no hierarchy. It's not everything else and then man, you know, <laughs> humans on top and they're separate from everything. We're taught that everything is, is equal and that all the animals have a human form or can be seen in a human form. And so they have just as much or more intelligence, you know, in fact, have a lot to teach people. And so that's how these transformations can happen. It's if the animal wants you to see it in its human form. There's a story where a man comes up to an ice hole and then there realizes there's, there's another man in his parker that's that's got stuck in the net, you know? And he's just stuck like that. Oh, can you, can you let me out? Please help me, you know? And so then he lets the man out, but then realizes that was actually a, a seal. That was a seal man. And just because that seal wanted that help, that seal allowed itself to be seen in human form. We have our dimi, the body, which returns to Nuna, the earth. And we have Atif, who is our name, that has been passed down to us over the generations. The spirit of our Atif lives on so long as man remembers that name. It would be hard to describe what happens after death, the feeling is that when our Anirinir returns to Sila, then that may be reborn if the name is passed on to a new child who can then retain some of the memories of the original name. And so it's not uncommon for grown-ups or adults to meet a child who has the same name maybe as their grandmother and say, hi, Akka which means grandma, hi, Appa, or hi, little mom, or hi, little dad, because it's the traditional belief that their soul you know, is continuing on. Humans are renewed and replenished over time. Just like our plants, every year flowers are born and bloom and they die. Next year, they are born again. The recurring type of character in Anupiak stories is the manslayer. And the manslayer is kind of this 
bad guy. And I think really what's at risk when the manslayer comes into story is the livelihood of individuals and the whole community. And so the manslayer is really used as a way to say, don't act only for yourself. Always hold the community in your heart. Oftentimes in these stories, there is one person that will stand up. And, and what this humble person will represent who faces that manslayer is a return to order, a return to true living in the community. And it just takes that one person. It could just be that one person that can help to change everything. Because everyone wants to live a good life. Everyone wants to have a good community. With regard to the environment, the blizzards have been one of the key elements that have impacted the survival of people, in, especially in the hard uh, winter. We know a blizzard is coming when the moon is starting to get fuzzy. We also look at the stars. When the stars are twinkling fast, we know a storm is approaching. We look to the clouds in the sky to give us a direction the storm is coming from. We learn this uh, as children by observing weather on a daily basis. With the story of Kunuk Sayuka, told by Robert Cleveland, it's just a it's just a masterwork. It's a well-known story among the Inupiaq people. And in our case, of producing a video game that really reflects indigenous heritage, it's, it captures the imagination. And it's something that you have a very specific kind of task to do. But there's a blizzard, you know, and it is just a non-stop blizzard that is overpowering the people. And there's one man that wants to figure it out. And in our case of the story, it's a girl that wants to find the source of that blizzard. The blizzard man, it's like that is the physical embodiment of an element of nature. And so there's a person that needs to go up and take away that, that adds, that's chipping away that, that snow. In that community, the person least expected is the one who stands up and makes the difference. Humility is something that we value. And where that comes from is the idea that you are not the biggest thing in the world. And when you live in an extreme environment, like where the Inuit reside, you are at the whim of the environment, of the climate, of the animals. You can be as prepared as you can, you know, by learning from your elders that you know, you're not the biggest force in the world.